All right, uh, so Chris Siders, as we mentioned earlier, is going to talk about protecting controlled, unclassified information in non-federal information systems and organizations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exciting stuff, huh? <laughs> Thank you. So as I said, I'm Chris Siders. I'm a security analyst with the University of Pittsburgh, uh, CISSP certified since uh, 2002. I'm with the uh, central IT department at uh, University of Pittsburgh. We're called the Computing Services and Systems Development, CSSD. Uh, standard disclaimer, these are my views and they do not re represent the views of the University of Pittsburgh or its faculty or staff. Um, if you're familiar with Pittsburgh, we have five campuses, uh, 36,000 uh, plus students with 12,000 faculty and staff. Um, in addition to being an academic institution, we're also um, highly involved in research. Uh, we're ranked nine uh, nationally in federal science and uh, engineering funding, according to the National uh, Science Foundation, and we're ranked fifth uh, uh, in U.S. Uh, universities um, uh, based on uh, National Institutes of Health. Um, this is our agenda for tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, security frameworks and, and why you might want to use them. Uh, compliance drivers uh, for why you might want to use uh, frameworks in uh, academia and research. Um, going to be talking about a tale of three frameworks. Um, that, uh, since my time with the University of Pittsburgh, uh, I started there in 2013. I've been involved in three different frameworks. Uh, FISMA, uh, the cybersecurity, NIST cybersecurity framework, and the NIST uh, 800-171. Um, and then we're also going to talk about implementation guidelines and just how uh, how I went through uh, implementing some of those uh, those those three uh, standards. So uh, security frameworks. Um, basically, uh, I think most people in here are probably aware uh, a security framework is uh, just a foundation for an information security program. Um, it's basically a, br a blueprint that you could follow or that institutions could follow to develop their information security program. Um, we used to just refer to them as best practices, um, but I think somebody at, at some point, sometime, people uh, got together and decided to say, like, let's let's put all these what what we're calling best practices, I put that in quotes, um, because there was no, uh, everyone's, everyone had their own idea what, the, what, what was best. Um, but I think uh, people put together what was, what was best practices for an information security program and uh, turn those into frameworks. Um, in addition to using it to, to build your information security program, frameworks can be used to audit uh, or review an existing program. So if you have an existing um, information security program and you're curious to see, um, basically just do a, a health check on it, you can uh, grab a, a framework and uh, compare your uh, program against a framework. Um, another use for uh, frameworks is to um, use it to guide your uh, strategic planning. And the NIST cybersecurity framework is uh, especially useful for that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, they basically have this concept of a current profile where you assess yourself for where you're currently at, and then you assess yourself for your target profile for where you want to be and, and what controls and uh, what areas where you want to improve. Um, and then you can do, use that as a, a very easy gap analysis analysis to, um, to uh, help drive your, your um, planning activities. And, and finally, another reason why you might want to be uh, involved with security frameworks is you might have compliance requirements. So there's, uh, if, if the last reason is the reason why you're, uh, you're looking at frameworks, uh, there's no reason to be intimidated. Although, that being said, um, federal contracts um, might require that you use um, be in compliance with uh, several standards. The two that I've seen in the federal contracts that we've gotten at the university, um, there's uh, FISMA requirements and more recently uh, requirements to follow the NIST 800-171. And um, if you are, if you do happen to be an institution like uh, Pittsburgh, and you do get federal contracts, um, it might not be really uh, easily um, noticeable 
that you're subject to these uh, these provisions. Uh, if you're not actively looking at your contracts, um, there could be language buried in those contracts that are, are holding you to following these standards. But if you've never seen the contracts that your researchers are getting or that your um, your um, contractors are getting, you may not be aware that uh, that you're subject to these. And uh, we discovered that uh, a lot of the contracts that were coming through um, had these languages in them. And um, in most cases, the researchers in the IT uh, department that they were using were not following these standards. So what we did was we put um, um, a process in place with the Office of, or Office of Research. So anytime new, any new contract came in, we have them looking for these language terms. Um, and if they see that, then they uh, contact the, uh, the CSSD department. And re we review the language, review the uh, research project, and uh, determine where the, the project's going to uh, occur on the network and make sure that, uh, that the required controls can be met. Um, we warn the researchers that there could be significant costs to the research project by implementing the security controls that are required by these. So if you have a researcher that's you know, just getting a $5,000 uh, contract, and we don't want to tell them it's going to cost them $10,000 a year for us to host their, their uh, computer environment in, in our data center. So um, that's the, the driving reason why we wanted to, uh, to, to get with the Office of Research to, um, to identify these. So um, you might see a language such as uh, NIST Special Public publication uh, 853, that would indicate that you might uh, need to follow FISMA um, guidelines. If you're working with Department of Defense contracts, you might see a DFAR um, uh, reference, 252.204-7012, uh, Safeguarding Covered Defense Information and, and Cyber Incident Reporting. That actually implies that you need to be following the 800-171 control. Um, and then obviously if it calls out the control itself, um, you obviously need to follow it. Um, or if you see a contract that uh, identifies that it's specifically related to controlled, unclassified information. And it'd be nice if you had unlimited time to, to be in compliance, but more for the, in the case of the Department of Defense, that DFAR con contract, um, if that's in any, any contracts, it requires the contract to implement the NIST 800-171 standards as soon as practical, but no later than December 31st, 2017. So you're probably a little behind the times if you haven't uh, implemented that yet. So you might want to actually go back through your contracts or have your Office of Research contract go back through contracts to see if that, uh, that uh, term or that provision is in any of your, your contracts. And, when we see it in our contracts, it's it's buried in the end. It's like in the appendix at the end, and they say, oh, by uh, agreeing to this contract or a subcontract, you're going to agree to all these, these DFAR terms. And there could be 20, 30 DFAR terms in there. So that could be buried in there. So you might not even be aware that you're, um, you're subject to this uh, compliance requirement um, uh, when, when you really are. Um, Another reason for, for compliance, the Department of Education is dropping some not-so-subtle hints that uh, they might be requiring uh, educational institutions to start following the NIST 800-171. Um, this is an excerpt from the uh, Dear Colleague letter that was sent out to all uh, institutions of higher education in July 1st of 2016. Um, and they strongly encourage institutions uh, that are not following the standards to, um, to do a gap analysis and immediately begin to design and implement plans. So they're, they're laying the groundwork here. Um, the consensus is, is that they're uh, uh, shortly going to in, stop encouraging us and start mandating that higher education institutes start, uh, start utilizing this standard, especially when it comes to um, financial aid um, and, uh, and, and financial aid information. So the, um, the term controlled classified information, um, that's a term that's uh, specifically related to the, the NIST 800-171. And it's classified as any information that's not, I shouldn't say classified, it's, it's defined as any inf federal information that's not in a classified category. So if it's not secret, top secret, any of those classifications or any other classifications, it's going to fall into the controlled unclassified information. They have these 
22 different categories and 85 subcategories, and and they're vague. I I I don't even know why, you know, the, the purpose of why these have these because they could apply to pretty much everything. It could be PII, um, like health information. Um, so under like the category 17, privacy. Um, one of the, the subcategories is is health information. So, um, so potentially, if if you're having dealing with health information, even if even if you're not a um, a health institution, if for some reason you you know are dealing with health information, um, you know this this standard could apply. Well, for example, like let's say you were a Medicaid contractor, or a Medicare contractor, absolutely, yeah. And likewise, it's the same as SB. Yeah. And then LES would be specific um, versions of law enforcement sensitive stuff. Mm -hmm. Which a lot of different firms describe. Yeah. You know, something that's, it, it's just interesting because, like, you, you think, like, secret might be your worst level of security, but then you have this kind of just a box and all this data just for people that it's important and it's federal. What do we do? So, as you get more of this name, could it really be anything federal? Yeah, and there is a lot of gray areas. Uh, a lot of the contracts that I've been working with, um, we try to determine if the information really is CUI because the university might be doing work um, for a contractor or for a contractor, even a subcontract, where we're a subcontractor to another contractor that's working for the, the, the federal government. And in those cases, um, we might be doing work to generate, you know, a deliverable to give to the contractor. Is that work that we're doing CUI? Is the work product that we're giving them CUI? And we actually, we just ask, you know, uh, either the sponsoring agency or the, the sub, or the primary contractor, you know, is this CUI? And a lot of times they can't tell us. And we're like, well, you need, someone needs to tell us whether or not we need to be following this or not. Yeah, and that should be the job of Yeah, and they didn't ask the questions themselves, so they don't know how to answer the questions to us. So it, it, it's difficult because, again, it's fairly new. And I'll get into the history of these uh, a little later. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk to you about Tale, uh, Tale of Three Frameworks. Um, since I started with Pitt in, in 2013, I've been involved in three different frameworks. Um, when I got there in 2013, they had already um, spent significant efforts into uh, building this FISMA model. Um, they, uh, the thinking was back then that um, if they uh, built this FISMA model, um, it would help facilitate uh, us getting awards for federal contracts that uh, required um, FISMA, or they had FISMA, uh, FISMA language in them. So uh, we thought we could get a competitive advantage by having this pre-built. Um, basically a cook cut, cookie cutter uh, environment that we built. Um, and then when we got a new contract in, we could just uh, apply the, um, the stock uh, FISMA system security plan and just customize it for the specific uh, aspects of the project. And, uh, and we could uh, just uh, replicate this model throughout. Um, unfortunately, uh, we built it. And we only got three contracts that um, <laughs> that were uh, uh, that actually had FISMA language. And the, the model that we built, um, there's three different types of FISMA um, classifications. There's low, moderate, and high. Um, and each one has progressively more stringent controls. Um, our model was a FISMA moderate um, level, um, and the three um, contracts that we got were FISMA low. Um, so. Um, it uh, really wasn't a good investment. I mean, it was a, a successful project, um, but um, the, um, the actual benefit we, we did not get out of it. Um, the second framework we started working with in 2015, we decided to go with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, we had a des uh, desire to come up with a standard that we could use uh, across the entire university. So instead of just building a standalone model, um, that could be just be used for those uh, those use cases. We wanted a standard that we could use uh, across the entire university. Um, 
and we um, we wanted to use it um, within CSSD as well as within uh, the individual colleges and departments throughout the university. Um, we, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, it's really good for doing a gap analysis. And um, when we did our assessment uh, of uh, CSSD, it really did align with a lot of the existing um, initiatives that we had already had in place, but it actually gave some justification for why those initiatives were, were needed. And we could actually show how it would uh, improve our information security program uh, to the point where we, were, where we wanted it to. We, um, uh, piloted this, uh, our uh, assessment with the Swanson School of Engineering. They have uh, 13 different departments under there, like chemical engineering and, um, you know, structural engineering. Um, all of them operate com almost completely separate from each other. So um, they, each department did their own um, self-assessment um, and it was very successful. And they were, they were really happy with it. Uh, again, they did their, um, their, current their, their current profile and then did their target profile, which helped them, um, again, identify gaps where, um, where, they, um, where they could improve their program. But again, um, we really didn't roll it out any further after the pilot. Um, we had actually lost our, our CISO, um, and we were without a, um, a leader for a while. So we were just uh, surviving, you know, trying to survive on our own without a, without a head. And um, we had kind of noticed that the 800-171 was becoming more prevalent um, standard, uh, especially in some of our contract languages. But the, doesn't NIST um, tell you in order, like, if you have 853-171, they're just trying to meet each other really well, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll show a crosswalk later. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Good, John. So just take a minute and maybe explain Yeah, I, th I think I'll get to that later on. If, if I don't, uh, just remind me again. I have some like implementation steps we went through, and I'll, I'll break down each of the frameworks, um, high level controls, and then drill down into the low level controls for each framework, and then you know com compare and contrast. Um, the three different frameworks. Um, okay, so in 2017, uh, we started looking at the, the 800-171. Uh, we were definitely seeing a lot more contracts for the Department of Defense coming in. Um, they actually adopted it. Uh, every, pretty much every Department of Defense contract is going to have 800-171 uh, 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 requirements in it. Um, they were the first uh, federal agency to um, to adopt this, and, and we expect uh, other uh, agencies uh, to start uh, start following it. So, um, we thought because we were seeing all those in our um, DoD contracts, um, the indications from the Department of Education that they wanted uh, uh, institutions to start following it, and um, we just kind of thought it was it was a better framework. Um, it was a lot more. I don't want to say. Well, it definitely is a lot more simpler than, than FISMA. Um, and um, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's better than the NIST cybersecurity framework. I think the NIST cybersecurity framework is still a good um, tool to use for assessing your information security program and um, uh, continuously monitoring and assessing. And again, doing the you know, constant target and uh, um, the current and target profile to um, basically keep doing a, a health check on your information security program. But the um, 800-171 is a good, uh, a good framework if you don't already have a, um, an existing framework. The one thing I'll point out, um, like I kind of mentioned, if, if you have a sponsoring agency um, or even another prime contractor, <laughs> Um, going to them and asking them for help on how they're actually implementing these these controls that they're requiring of you, um, you'll just get silence. Uh, they won't uh, they won't tell you what they're doing because I don't think they are doing it. I think it's something that that they've been mandated to put these provisions in the contracts um, for any uh, subcontractors or any um, anybody that's doing work on the behalf of the federal government. Um, 
but I don't think they're doing it themselves. So they've been um, less than helpful whenever we've asked about this. Even when we ask them, you know, is this is the you know, is the information you're you're giving us CUI? And they're like, well, we don't know what's CUI. It's like you need to tell us if it's CUI because you know it, it's really going to dictate whether or not we need to to follow specific standards. Not really. Um, basically, those, those screens I had earlier where it just had the, the categories, that's actually taken out of the, um, the 171 document. I've never, I haven't seen anything like that, no. But it just says tax. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The same standards to all your data, and it sounds like there's not a good way to segregate and determine what is C. Yeah. The one thing you can do, though, is between low, moderate, and high, right? That That's right? FISMA. So there's no low, moderate, and high for 171? No. Okay. No. No, it either is or isn't. Um, I have had fairly good success by doing pushback and saying, we're not going to, we, we want you to strike. The provision that says 800171, unless you can conclusively say that the data is CUI, and because they won't know, usually they've just been striking the uh, striking the uh, the provision. So I've had a lot of luck with with just getting them to to remove the requirement again because I push back because I usually ask them like how are they following 800171, and again they're saying or not. So I think they don't want us to call out the fact that. That they're not following what they're requiring of us, so they, they strike the provision from us. I mean, the way I, I see it, and this is kind of a very loose definition, is it would embarrass the government if this information got out as the CUI. So, for example, a tax return, if everybody's tax returns get out there, very big scandal at the CUI. Um, same thing with Medicaid, Medicare, people wouldn't want it. That data would be a big scandal. Um, mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the OPM read, that was already classified as something else. Well, it's probably classified as something else. Yeah, that was FISMA, even but... On, even on like maybe civilian level, that could be CUI. And then that would be a huge thing. So that's the way you have to look at it. If something happened in this data, would it be embarrassing to that agency? Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a uh, random information architecture, not necessarily, but if it's something integral to their mission, I mean, that, you know, that, that's the way I try to look at this stuff, um, you know, without any other guidance. Yeah, and so I, from what I've seen, it's labeled. That's what it is. Um, or, for example, law enforcement open in open investigation, you know, investigation. Um, you know, that'd be CUI on the else. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think that's the way. If you don't have any guidance, you have to look at it. Yeah, and and, and as we go through the history of FISMA and the the uh, 171, and even getting down to some of the details, um, you'll see that 171 was created to basically bridge the gap between having someone follow FISMA standards, which nobody can. I mean, that's, it's, it's horrific. I'll show you, like, how big the document is and, and just how many controls there are. Um, requiring, uh, a, like, the University of Pittsburgh to follow FISMA standards just to protect, you know, some... Let me think of an example of a, a project that we work on. Um, one was for the military. We um, we were analyzing tissue samples that were exposed to um, explosive forces. So um, you know they they took muscle tissue, blew it up, and then they want us to examine the data and see uh, how various um, like protection garments would protect the the tissues. Is that super sensitive information? Does it require you know the 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 four hundred and nine FISMA controls? No. Is it you know? sensitive military information that, you know, that should have a reasonable level of protection? Yeah. So, 800-171 is, is a reasonable set of controls to apply to that level of information. So, I'm just going to go quickly through um, the history of this stuff. Um, again, um, the FISMA was uh, an act that came out in 2002. It actually was a law. Um, and basically, it uh, <coughs> 
provides a framework for the protection of, uh, you know, um, federal operations and assets. Uh, some key requirements of it, um, uh, set of information security standards, guidelines, and techniques to reduce the information security risk to an acceptable level. Um, it's made up of two parts. There's the um, FIPS 200 series, as well as the um, NIST special publication 853. The 853 is the main um, guts of uh, the FISMA. That's the controls within the uh, within there. And uh, even if you're not implementing a FISMA system, the 853 controls are a good reference document. Um, even for the 171 and the NIST cybersecurity framework, or even other frameworks. Um, it's very prescriptive. It goes down to uh, high level details for a, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of controls. So um, it's a great reference. Uh, reference. Well, FIPS is good too, especially for your encryption, like, um, you know, like DLS and things like that. Um, you know, good in that sense to understand what's in the network. Yeah, and I, actually, the 853 will reference the, the FIPS documents within the uh, with individual controls. Yeah, that's what I think when I think of FIPS, I mean, the, you know, the encryption level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as I said, um, the the eight hundred fifty three document, which again is just one one document within the uh, the, the the whole FISMA, um, it's four hundred eighty seven pages long, um, and it within there within the first page, it's going to start referencing other uh, uh, eight hundred series documents and other NIST documents. So um, it's an ugly standard to uh, to try and read and implement. Um, it's 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 a monster. So these are the um, the controls. There's um, 18 control families um, with 240 high level controls. Um, I'd mentioned there's low, medium, and high. So you see for the yeah. For the for the uh, FISMA low, you might not have the same number of controls um, as you do for the the, mod, the medium and high. Um, there's one control in the medium that I found um, really makes the difference, and that's um, there's um, data loss protection controls um, between the, the the low and the, the medium. So um, there's there's requirements to, um, to to keep information from leaking out of the system. So. Um, the way we we built our FISMA model was it was completely isolated um, on private address space, and there was very little connections in and out of it, and uh, very locked down. Did you use DLPs? No, there there was no means to actually get information out of it. It was a completely closed system. Um, it was a single purpose application, a, a database application for um, brain tissue. Um, so it, um, researchers would just uh, key information into it. There was a means to, um, to encrypt data and um, go through like a data exchange server to get information out that was sent back up to NIH, but for the most part, um, it was a co completely closed system. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, okay, these are um, the detailed controls for the access control uh, family. So this is all the controls for um, access control. Um, again, you can see if it's NA, that means that that control is not, uh, not needed for, uh, for the FISMALO. But, uh, you know, this, there's obvious, you know, Controls, least privilege, session termination, session locks, remote access, um, all sorts of things. Um, you'll notice some of the control um, families, they'll have an actual control, but then they'll have uh, sub-controls as well. Um, so again, it's highly detailed. And I'll have an example of a control here uh, coming up um, right here. So this is AC22, um, publicly accessible content. Um, so basically, and again, this is a framework. Um, this is just the, the foundation. Um, you take these controls and you make them your own. So um, for something like, uh, again, here's the sub-controls too. So um, AC22B, 
trains authorized individuals to ensure that publicly accessible information does not contain non-public information. So you can change that or put a, an addition in there and basically just say, our information security program um, um, informs um, employees on acceptable use of social media and uh, the, what's, what's allowed and not allowed to be posted on, on social media and other public websites. So um, you take these controls and you make them your own. But again, you can see this is very prescriptive. It, it goes down into some, some fairly, um, fairly detailed um, options. You know, it, it says that you should define the frequency to review the content on publicly accessible websites. And then, um, yeah, looking for non-public information on the websites and then remove it on a, in a, in a timely basis. So um, very prescriptive. Um, we'll compare this to controls for the other um, the other frameworks. So the NIST cybersecurity framework um, came out in 2014. It was an executive order. It wasn't a law. Um, it was a risk based risk based approach to managing cybersecurity. And um, again, it can be a foundation for a new uh, cybersecurity fr uh, framework or a cybersecurity program or a mechanism to um, improve an existing program. And then in December 2015, oh no, this is an update. So um, yeah, after it, it came out, um, after a year, they uh, NIST sent out a request for information for feedback on the, on the framework. They held a workshop in 2016, um, again, to get more feedback. They've took those, um, that feedback and they have, um, actually I think they're on their second draft uh, of version 1.1. And uh, they really haven't changed, I don't think they've, they've changed too much in the, uh, the new version, but, um, but they, they are actively supporting it. So the framework has five main um, categories. Um, very simple, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And then under, under that, there's, um, you know, there's, there's subcategories for each of the main categories. And here's an example of um, access management um, subcategories. So physical devices and systems within the, within the organization are inventoried. That's the, that's the control. Compare that to the, the FISMA where, it, you know, it had, you know, four or five different sublevels. This is, you know, very open-ended. Um, software platforms and applications within the organization are inventoried. Organization communications and data flow or map. So just knowing knowing what your your data flows are. So um, very uh, very simple controls that you can take with and just describe how you're what you're doing to to meet those controls. Um, uh, you'll find a lot of um, crosswalks for a lot of these fra frameworks. So um, any one of these, if you you know familiar with COBIT or um, ISO standards, um, and you want a more detailed information, actually there's the 853. <clears throat> so if you're not sure how to implement that control, you can go to the to, um, 853, go to configuration management, control number eight, and it'll have the, the details there that you can uh, pick through and it might help you um, decide how to, how to meet those controls. <laughs> So as I mentioned a couple times, um, the one of the core tenets of the the cybersecurity framework is the uh, the concept of a current profile and a target profile, um, and uh, and it's actually pretty challenging. Actually, when I sat down with the School of Engineering, and I started asking them, you know, how they were meeting certain controls, you know, like uh, patch management, you know, and they said, well. We're, we're, we're in the process of doing this and like, go time out, you know, what are you actually doing? Not do you want to do or what are you planning on doing or what's in, what's in progress? What are you currently doing? Um, and once they got that mindset down, um, they could do the current profile and then we went back through a second time and said like, okay, now what do you want to do as far as, you know, patch management? And they said, oh, we want to do this and we're planning on doing this. And like, okay, put that as your, your, your target um, for that control. And, uh, and, and then they loved the end result because, again, it just spelled out specifically um, the areas that they wanted to do. And in a lot of cases, they already knew what they, the, the, um, the action item was. But, but in other cases, there, there wasn't an action item, but it, it drove 
um, some of their strategic dis discussions and even some tactical discussions on how they were going to, um, to get to the point where they wanted to be. Okay, so uh, the history of the NIST 800-171. In November 2010, um, there was uh, basically to increase the, to address the increasing federal government need to protect sensitive, unclassified government information, the ones we were talking about earlier, that didn't fall under any, any of the other um, classifications. Um, they created an executive order, 13556. Um, and uh, they had uh, NARA um, was charged with implementing the order. Uh, NARA reached out to NIST and said, hey, you guys are good at drift drafting guidelines. Help us draft a guideline for, um, to meet this executive order. So um, they, they basically um, looked at the FIPS standards in the 853. And um, I like to think of it as a FISMA light. So 800-171 is, is FISMA light. So uh, key requirements for protecting CUI, uh, consistent statutory and regulatory requirements for federal and non-federal system, uh, safeguards for uh, implementing the federal and non-federal systems, and confidential impact is no lower than moderate. Um, uh, basically, that's the FISMA moderate. So um, if you have like a FISMA, FISMA high, um, you would not be able to, uh, to meet that with, uh, with NIST 8-171. So it applies to um, CUI that we were talking about. Um, it uh, specifically calls out um, information sharing outside of the federal government, um, institutions for research purposes, or for um, subcontracts. Um, again, that's a lot of work that we do. And um, if no other federal laws or regulations apply to controlling the data, um, NIST 800-171 applies. Um, again, there's that gray area whether or not the information actually is federal information that you're dealing with. Again, it, it may be information that's being used to support the project, but it may not actually be um, federal information. One thing you might see, um, a lot of vendors are hosting webinars saying uh, how their uh, products can help you be um, NIST, uh, NIST certified. And uh, while they might be able to help you um, implement some of the controls and monitoring of the controls, you can't just uh, write a check and uh, expect to be compliant. So here's the NIST 800-171 controls. There's just 14 control families, um, 110 controls um, instead of the, um, how many was for FISMA? 200 some? Um, I think I have it later. And um, they have, um, they broke them, broke them down into basic controls and drive controls. The um, drive controls are just um, detailed level of the, um, the basic controls. Um, again, the basic controls are kind of just high level statements. The drive controls go a little bit deeper and, and get into some, some of the more details. But uh, as you can see, there's, there's not even a whole lot of, uh, aside from the access control um, family, which has uh, 20 drive controls. Um, the majority of them have just a few basic controls and then uh, a few more drive controls. These are the descriptions of uh, the various families and, uh, you know, the, the goals they're supposed to accomplish. Access control, limit information system access to authorized individuals. Makes sense. Ensure that system users are properly trained. Easy enough. Create information system audit records. Establish baseline configurations and inventory of systems. This is what we used to call best practices, right? But somebody just took the best practices and said, hey, let's put them together for people that may not know what best practices are. So um, I'm not going to read through all of them, but um, you can kind of see that they're, they're fairly basic, um, basic instructions. Conduct risk, risk assessments. Good stuff. Um, here's a breakdown of the... Um, some of the basic controls, and again, you know, access control 3.1, limit information system access to authorized users, process acting on behalf of authorized users or devices. Limit information system access to the types of transactions and functions that authorized users are permitted to execute. So if you can just define how you're doing that in your organization, 
you've, you've met the controls. Let's see. Yeah, so these are, this is the access control one again, which that one has a lot of derive controls. But uh, even those are fairly simple. Control the flow of CUI in accordance with approved authorizations. So, you know, do you define authorized, uh, approved authorizations? So, who in your organization is approved to um, access the, um, the information and control where, it's, where it flows? Yes, John. Yeah, it, 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 it does take time, especially depending on the, like for FISMA, um, that was definitely, it required almost every department within the IT department um, and um, internal audit and um, general counsel and uh, probably some departments that I'm um, not aware of or that haven't, uh, it's not coming to mind. But yeah, that, that involved a lot of meetings. It was actually a, a formal project. Um, and it wasn't just uh, an IT project. And it did involve um, uh, determining which controls um, we needed to meet with the various uh, stakeholders and uh, meet with them to uh, work out what the controls should be. Did you try to do like web surveys first or how did you try to like, you know, manage it? Yeah. No. Um, but that's a lesson learned, and that's how we did the that's how we did the other two um, two um, frameworks. And and I have some slides to uh, go over how we did that too. But um, yeah, for for FISMA, we there's a lot of lessons learned from that. Um, and again, it took a lot of time, and there was a lot of uh, in person interviews versus versus um, surveys. So um, we we had some lessons learned from that. So um, yeah, these are this, just the, th the three frameworks. Uh, FISMA has 18 control families, um, three subgroups, the low, moderate, and high, and uh, 240 controls. Uh, then a cybersecurity framework has five control families, um, 23 subgroups, and 109 controls. 800-171 has 14 control families, um, two subgroups. I, I call them subgroups, but really it's just the basic and the derived, uh, derived controls. Um, and they have 110 controls. So, um, so this is good. this is this was our approach to um, to implementing the, the three frameworks uh, for FISMA. Um, again, there was a lot of project meetings, a um, lot of pre pre um, implementation planning, a lot of documentation. Um, but uh, the main part of it was this this uh, of the controls was building this isolated environment. We had dedicated uh, virtual uh, hardware that was separate from the, um, the VM clusters that we used for um, normal academic uh, systems. Um, we segmented them off on their own private network space, uh, inaccessible by uh, any of the other networks, and um, um, basically um, created um, a repeatable model that we could just cookie cut and, and, and spread out um, once we had all the um, administrative uh, aspects taking care of all the, um, a lot of it was policy driven. There was a lot of technical controls, um, but there was a lot of policy driven controls as well. Um, because of the cost, we did, we did implement this as a chargeback model um, because it, it did require um, a lot of capital expenditure and there was a lot of ongoing um, work that was involved. There's, FISMA has controls for continuous monitoring, continuous risk assessments, um, Anytime the system changed, you had to document the change, um, document any um, new risks and um, how you're going to address those risks. They call them uh, plan of actions and milestones, POEMs. Um, so basically, you, you had to document everything about the system. Um, since we only had three customers and it did require so much effort to maintain um, the people that were maintaining it, stop maintaining it 
and um, it pretty much died on the vine. So we're, we're doing the bare minimum to support the three customers that we currently have, but we're uh, no longer maintaining uh, uh, the, the model um, for any future customers. Our approach for the NIST cybersecurity framework was, uh, was a little different. Um, we came up with uh, a self-service questionnaire. And um, when we piloted it with the Swanson School of Engineering, we um, basically had the control questions that they would freeform answer. Um, but when we got the responses back from all the uh, 13 departments, they were um, inconsistent. Um, they might have misinterpreted the questions differently. Um, and there wasn't a, a consistent way to, um, to basically assess how the different departments um, were meeting the controls. So we decided to come up with um, a multiple choice solution. So for each of the controls, we had um, four possible answers that were various maturity levels um, to, to, to meet that control. Um, so um, let's see. Yeah, here's a... Um, uh, a sample of the, the, the question. So for the, um, for the first, again, it's the, the, the ID admin one, the, the physical devices are, um, and systems are inventoried. So the, the very first thing the CSF asks is, do you have an inventory of your systems? Because if you don't know what you have, you don't know, you know what needs protection. So um, we just came up with four, um, four levels. So um, an inventory exists. Um, the inventory is updated periodically to address new equipment. The, the inventory is updated to include relocated, repurposed, and sunset assets, and the process is automated. And they could check one or more of these. And if they check none of them, then, you know, they, that just meant that they did not have an inventory. Um, similar questions for the, um, for the applications. And we did this for the, you know, all 110 controls, and that way, um, you know, the departments could go in and just um, check off and you know how they thought they were they were meeting the control, and then we could uh, score um, score the departments based on how they did. Um, what questions did you have for your questionnaire? Um, for each of the hundred nine controls, we had most of the time we had four four different questions, four different maturity levels that we had. Four questions for each control. So. Or four options for each control. One question per control and then the four. Four options on how you might be meeting the control. Okay, because yeah. like I know we use I trust control for healthcare and there's a lot of things that within the control like that you can make a ton of questions for. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. That's the So you just did it more at a high level. Yeah, because again, these these were pretty simple simple controls with not a whole lot of levels. Okay. Um, you know, again, the inventory, you know, and, and we kind of structured them like this, like you're, 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 you're doing the bare minimum, or you might just be doing a little, or you're, you have an automated process or a system that, that's doing this for you. Um, and again, that was the, the purpose or the intent was so that we could kind of gauge um, which departments were strong in some areas and, and weak in others. And, and so that like if the engineering department could do it, they could see um, some departments might be weak in the access control family, but they're good in the protection family and vice versa. And again, just kind of to, to give us a, a measurement of how the various departments were, um, were meeting security, you know, based on this standard. That's a good idea. Yeah, because can you share your questionnaire? <laughs> is, is it an electronic? Is it so? I mean, a lot of times people don't know how to answer questions. <coughs> you su will you suggest? Can you give them a drop down box? Or yeah, then I think can. it's a great idea. Yeah, and that's the we came to that same conclusion oh, too. I don't know the question, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's process improvement. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there, a, <clears throat> is there any sort of like auditing to see how? Uh, Again, we never actually rolled out um, the cybersecurity um, assessment. We built it, but um, we we lost our CISO and we lost the um, the, the the drive to um, to use it as a as an assessment framework. We still might use it as an a framework uh, as a an assessment framework. Um, 
I think the initial intent was just to do purely attestation, um, but down the road, go back and maybe do some auditing and ask for evidence to make it be, be more evidence-based. So um, we definitely wanted to do it on an annual basis to reassess, um, but maybe that was something we'd do on, uh, on uh, the, the recurring events is, is asking how they're doing it. <laughs> I've been trying to get a GRC <laughs> for about four years now uh, to help with these things. Um, and it's, it's we've we got budget approval for it, but then other initiatives came in and uh, on a daily basis with our new CISO. Um, I say, like, you know, a GRC would help with that. <laughs> so I would love a GRC. And we actually have a GRC pro project that we're working on trying to um, to evaluate products. That's another yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, our approach for the 800-171, um, what we're currently doing, this is what, uh, uh, the current framework that we're working on. Um, we're building an initial questionnaire um, to send out to the entire university to identify where the high-risk data is. And then um, based on the answers to that question, um, they'll... Um, well, the initial questionnaire have some basic questions that everyone will fill out. Um, basically, um, even if it is low to moderate risk, and that, there's only about a dozen questions for that. Um, but for the ones that are using high risk data, we're going to send out a detailed questionnaire, and um, that's going to be the 110 con uh, controls. And we actually did for that one. We have um, it's a lot of yes no questions, but it's. Um, I don't say it's dumbed down questions, but there, we, we took the control, um, especially if there was multiple parts within the control, and we broke it down and said, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Um, yeah. Yeah, because we figured that, you know, because again, they're, they, depending on the department, it might be like the English department's administrative assistant that's going to be filling out this questionnaire because they don't have their own IT department. Whereas our FIS department, they have more IT people than, than we do. Um, so they're going to, you know, have, they're going to understand the question better. Um, but, uh, but that's where we're currently at. We're currently working on the, uh, the detailed questionnaire and finalizing the, the initial questionnaire that we're going to be sending out. And um, we definitely know this is going to be a multi-year project. Um, just to um, communicate to the to the university departments and uh, get them comfortable with what's going to be coming, and then uh, probably going to be a lot of hand holding as well um, as we roll these out. Um, this is um, yeah, this is an example of the initial questionnaire that's going out. So um, it's just going to be a checklist for them to identify what types of data that department deals with. Um, we're using Qualtrics as the, the survey tool, so it's mobile friendly. So um, we're going to try and make this as, as easy as possible on the, uh, on the end users. Um, in summary, um, there's obviously many frameworks that you can choose from. Um, these are just three NIST frameworks, but uh, obviously there's, there's many others. Um, compliance might be the, your driver. Uh, again, if your contract says that you must follow FISMA standards, you must follow FISMA standards. It says 800-171. Um, Again, if you're stuck with a, a given framework, um, you can use the other frameworks as reference. There's, there's crosswalks. Um, there, there's, um, we used, after we implemented the FISMA uh, model, we started uh, working with our um, School of Dental Medicine, which is a, a HIPAA-covered entity, um, to make sure that they had all the controls. So we were actually able to um, use a crosswalk to say um, for certain controls under the HIPAA environment. We already had the, the controls in HIPAA, so we, um, we didn't have to do a whole lot of work and we didn't have to start from scratch. So, um, yeah, they can, uh, the crosswalks can help and um, they can also help with uh, the control creation. Um, the only other suggestion I have is, is take your time. Um, these, uh, you, you can't build these overnight, um, but uh, if you dedicate the resources to them, they can, uh, they can actually be um, very helpful. So I appreciate your time.